This is part two of I'm Not Giving Up. Pushing chairs and tables out of the way while still on his hands and knees, McNair found some of his colleagues. Although he could hear people crying and moaning in other parts of the office, he and those in his group remained composed. They were determined to escape from the blinding smoke and choking fumes. But because no one knew where the source of the fire was or what had happened, finding a way out was still a matter of guesswork and luck. Betty Maxfield, a civilian who worked for the Army, crawled over to McNair and grabbed his ankle. Don't let go, he told her. They were getting pelted by falling pieces of burning ceiling and melting plastic. The sprinkler system provided some relief from the intolerable heat. Water from the sprinklers not only soaked them, but also formed dirty puddles on the carpet, which he scooped up and splashed on his face. Marilyn Wills took off her sweater and dunked it in one of the puddles to turn it into a makeshift filter. After she took a few breaths of fresher air through her sweater, she passed it back along the line so that everyone could take turns breathing through it. The chain had been, been snaking along the floor in the smoky darkness for five minutes when someone in another part of the office yelled, there's a window. As the group ca crawled toward the voice, McNair began to see a dim glow through the smoke that brightened as they drew closer. They finally reached a newly replaced window on the east side of the office that overlooked A&E Drive, a service window between the C and B rings. During the Pentagon renovations, old windows had been replaced with thick blast-proof ones that didn't open. Army Specialist Mike Petrovich picked up a printer and threw it against the window, but the machine bounced off the, gliss, the glass and hit him in the head. Seeing that, some of the members of the group worried that they were doomed. They had made it this far and were only two inches of glass away from safety, but the glass was unbreakable. Luckily, the impact from the plane had nudged the glass a few inches off the frame, allowing fresh air to seep in. One by one, McNair helped people in his group stick their faces next to the opening so that they could suck in clean air. When it was McNair's turn, he looked down outside and saw six men from the Pentagon staring at him and the others who were trapped on the second floor. We're going to go through this window and drop down, McNair told his colleagues in a voice raspy from inhaling smoke. But how, asked one, the opening isn't big enough and it's impossible to break the window. Here's how, McNair replied. He began kicking at the frame. So did Petrovich. Using all their leg power, the two worked feverishly to dislodge the window from the frame until they made a gap wide enough for a person to squeeze through. Marilyn and I are going to lower you as far as we can, McNair explained to the others, but it's a 15 feet drop, high enough to break your leg if you don't land right. Don't worry though, because there are people below who will try to catch you. On the service road, Craig Powell, a towering Navy SEAL instructed the five men with him to form a human net. They gathered in a circle, extended their arms, and held onto the forearms of those on the opposite side of the circle. McNair climbed onto the three-foot-high windowsill and chose longtime Army personnel employee Lewis Stevens to go first because she was having a serious difficulty breathing. When she balked, McNair ordered, Lewis, get your fanny up on the sill. McNair and Wills helped position Stevens, a petite woman, out the window. From below, Powell shouted, go, we'll catch you. Stevens released her grip from McNair and Wills and fell with her arms and legs together. However, seeing her plunge toward them, the men on the ground instinctively backed away, leaving it up to Powell to catch her by the hips and bring her hard but safely to the ground. Next, another woman, much bigger than Stevens, dropped from the window and landed right on Powell. On impact, both of them tumbled to the ground in pain. Before Powell had the chance to get set for a next person, another woman jumped. He dove underneath her just in time to break her fall. After nearly everyone in McNair's group had escaped, he told Wills, okay, Marilyn, it's your turn. You have to get out. I don't want to leave yet. Marion, her boss, disappeared somewhere back there, and I need to find her. This is the army. You don't leave a soldier behind. I'll go back and try to find her, said McNair. He crawled into the smoke until he was thwarted by intense heat and flames. He repeatedly shouted service name. Not hearing a reply, he called out, is anybody there? It's no use, he thought. 
I can't go in any further. There's nothing more I can do. When McNair returned to the window, Wills asked, did you find her? He shook his head. She burst into tears and started to head for the wall of smoke until he stopped her. You have to get out right now, he stressed. That's an order. The men below had pulled a dumpster next to the wall and placed a ladder in it, but its top rung was still several feet beneath the window. So Powell climbed into the bin and one of his comrades placed the bottom of the ladder on his shoulders so that the top reached near the base of the window. McNair then lowered Wills onto the ladder. While Powell held it steady, Wills climbed down the, into the arms of the men below. By the time McNair descended the ladder, all the people in his small group were nowhere to be seen. They had been taken to a triage area to be set up in the open air central courtyard. Somewhat shell-shocked and dazed, McNair tried to clear his head. I'm okay, I'm not hurt. He spotted a group of military men who were running in and out of a smoking hole on the first floor of the exterior wall of the sea ring. Their clothes were tattered and charred, their faces caked in soot. I'd better see how many, how I can help. He hurried over to them and learned that Navy people were trapped inside a blazing room behind a large air conditioning unit. Debris blocked an escape route. He joined several rescuers who had set up a bucket brigade. The person who was farthest inside the building would grab a piece of rubble or an object such as an office chair that was in the way and pass it back to the next person. We handed it down the line until the last person would toss it in the street. Before getting overcome with smoke, the person at the head would run out to catch some fresh air while the next in line would take over. McNair helped shove computers, equipment, and office partitions out of the way. While clearing a path, he spotted an arm poking out of the rubble. With another rescuer, he pulled out a woman who had been buried in a mound of debris. Then he and his comrades helped free six more Navy people. The rescuers had no water to snuff out the flames or tools to dig with, so McNair ran out and searched frantically for any equipment they could use. After getting a fire extinguisher, he ducked back into the hole. He sprayed foam onto the flames where the smoke was the thickest, but the stream sizzled and evaporated on contact. By now, he was no longer hearing any cries for help. Either everyone is out or those who aren't are dead, he thought. Like the other rescuers, he was driven out by the smoke and flames. Heading for another hole, McNair and the others were stopped by a Pentagon security officer who told him, you guys have to leave because there are reports of another plane heading this way. Another plane? McNair asked in bewilderment. What do you mean? A plane hit the Pentagon. But I thought it was a bomb. No, it was a passenger plane. Two more hit the World Trade Center in New York. Another is still in the air and it looks like it's aiming for Washington. Stunned by the news, McNair wandered down the service road and into the courtyard where Army Personnel Office Security Officer John Yates was on a stretcher being loaded into an ambulance. Seeing that Yates had been badly burned, McNair bent down to take his hand, but a piece of charred skin came off. McNair looked in his eyes and said, it's going to be okay, John. As his adrenaline worn off, McNair couldn't talk or breathe well. He went over to a medic who put him in an ambulance and gave him an IV on the way to the hospital. I feel bad that you're taking me when there must be survivors a lot worse off than me, he said. When the ambulance arrived at the hospital, medical personnel lined up at the emergency entrance, prepared for the onslaught of victims that never materialized. McNair was treated for smoke inhalation and spent the rest of the day lying in bed with an oxygen mask. Because he recovered quickly, his wife Nancy was allowed to bring him home later that night. The next day he, like most everyone else in his department who was physically able, returned to the job, but in temporary offices in Alexandria. We're not going to let the terrorists interrupt our work, McNair explained to Nancy. Whenever he went to work before 9-11, he always wore his Class B uniform, green trousers with a stripe down the side, a light green gray shirt with an eagle insignia on each shoulder board and a name tag on his chest. But on September 12th, McNair showed up for work wearing his battle dress uniform, camouflage fatigues and boots. So did everyone else at the Army Personnel Command. 
it was because the United States was now at war. At 10.10 a.m., 27 minutes after American Airlines Flight 77 struck the Pentagon, the section of the building holding the second floor personnel offices collapsed. It would take firefighters days to put out the fire. The Army Personnel Directorate lost 24 of its 240 staff members who lived and who died came down to timing and circumstance. Better for some and not so for others, McNair says. If it had happened on any other day of the week, I would have been killed, McNair points out. I would have been sitting at my desk, which was in the area that was completely destroyed, right outside the general's office, and where everybody in our department, including secretaries, aides, and officers were killed. My meeting started at 9 a.m. in the conference room across the hall and down a couple of doors. We were only 60 feet away from my desk. It took about six weeks before the Army Personnel Directorate moved back into the Pentagon. We took pride that our operations weren't interrupted, McNair says. Some never returned to the Pentagon. They just couldn't do it. For those of us who came back to the office, it was nonstop talk about the attack. Where were you when it hit? How did you escape? Did you see so-and-so? Later, it occurred to me that those who talked about it at work fared, fared better emotionally than those who didn't come back and were by themselves at home or in the hospital. McNair was awarded the Soldier's Medal for putting his own life at risk to help save others on 9-11. The Soldier's Medal, to me, confirmed that I did the right thing, he says. When I escaped the fire, I was still capable of helping others, so that's what I did. I have a hard time thinking of myself as someone special. I'm not a hero. I'd like to think that most people would do what I did if they were in the same situation. It was just the right thing to do. When McNear, the married father of two, retired in 2002, he was given the Army's highest award for military service, the Distinguished Service Medal. He then went to work for the American Military University, which is part of the American Public University system. He is now the Vice President of Academic Services. Even though years have passed since 9-11, McNair admits, I think about it to some degree every single day. <laughs>